This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This chapter now goes through and looks at complex group structures. I think it's important to emphasise the word structures as opposed to just calling it complex groups. Okay, uh, it is a bit more challenging, but the, the difficulty arises within the structure of the group because previously we've just seen basic groups, parent, subsidiary. Now what we need to look at it is whereby not just the parent has an investment in an entity, but maybe the subsidiary also has an investment within an entity, which makes the structure that little bit more complex. So, so let's just have a look at, at what we're talking about. So if we're thinking about complex groups, there are two types of complex groups that you need to be comfortable with within the syllabus. Uh, there is what's referred to as a vertical complex group structure that we look at first. And then we move it on to think about your D-shaped complex group structure. So what have we got? Well, with a vertical group structure, we've got X that has control over another company, say Y. So you have the power to direct the activities. You own greater than 50% of the voting rights. So X is the parent, Y is the sub. However, what happens now is as well as the parent having an investment in the subsidiary, the subsidiary itself has an investment in another entity. And that investment that the sub has gives it control of that other entity. So, so what we've got now effectively is the parent controls the sub and the sub controls another subsidiary. So indirectly, this parent here not just controls this sub, but also this subsidiary here, effectively a, a sub subsidiary. Because let's face it, if the parent can put the directors in the sub because they have control, and if the sub has control over the sub sub, shall we say, then we will put our directors, won't we, in the sub sub? OK, because if we control the directors in the sub, we can tell them who to appoint in the sub subsidiary. OK, so we effectively, indirectly control that sub subsidiary. OK, so we have a vertical group structure, parent, sub, sub subsidiary. OK, D shaped group is whereby you have a, a company that has control over B. And then what happens there is that not just B, but also A has an ownership interest in C, okay? Now B may not directly control C, so it may not own greater than 50%, but because of A's holding within C, when we combine the holdings together, maybe then we have indirect control, okay? So indirectly, we are able to cast greater than 50% of the votes and therefore we can put in place the directors in company C. Uh, and if that's the case, then we have control, don't we? Okay, if we have greater than 50% of the voting rights in company C, that as well is a sub subsidiary. And we have effectively now what's referred to as a D shaped group, don't we? A, B, C, D. Okay, so a D shaped group. It looks like the letter D. Okay, uh, either of which can be examined within question one for 35 marks. Uh, but when we're getting examined on question one for 35 marks, we are just focusing on the group aspects now, but there is a lot more to it other than just the groups. Individual accounting standards will be tested as well, but the focus for now is just on the groups. So if we're going to focus on the groups aspects of complex groups, what are the issues that we need to consider? Well, what we've got there, first of all, is we need to think about the ownership. We know how much P owns in S uh, and how much S owns in SS, but indirectly, how much does P own in the sub subsidiary? Because when we're looking at preparing the group accounts, we're preparing the group accounts for the parent shareholders, aren't we? So we know how much the parent shareholders own in the sub, but how much do they indirectly own in the sub sub? Because that's going to be important when we look at recording our share of the post acquisition profit in the sub subsidiary isn't it so we need to look at our percentage ownership uh, that will then go through there as well and help us think about the acquisition date we'll talk about that as we go along p acquired s on a particular date in time when did s acquire ss because that will have implications on when the sub subsidiary became part of the group and it's when the sub subsidiary becomes part of the group 
that we then begin to consolidate it from. Okay, so it'd be important to understand the acquisition dates. We'll also be able to go through there as well and work out the goodwill. We know the parent, we know the sub, we can calculate the goodwill and the sub nice and straightforwardly. But what about the goodwill in the sub subsidiary? How do we go through there and begin to calculate that? Same working with just an ever so slight adjustment in it. And then what we've got finally it is the non-controlling interest. We've worked out the percentage ownership. So if we know how much we indirectly own within the sub subsidiary, we know what the effective non-controlling interest is. And then we can use that to help us calculate the non-controlling interest within the sub subsidiary, can't we? OK, so they're the four aspects that we're going to have to consider. Uh, it sounds a lot. It's not as bad as what you probably are initially thinking. Uh, and I always say to students, look, if you've got a complex group structure, you know, you've got a parent, you know, you've got a subsidiary. That's F7. So deal with that first. Get that done. Get that dusted. Get it out of the way and relax. And then just apply your F7 knowledge to the P2 knowledge, which is dealing with the sub subsidiary. OK, it's actually the same workings, but just a couple of twists along the way. OK, uh, so that's it. That's what we're going to go through in the next few sessions. Begin to look at. We're going to see those issues there and apply them to a vertical group and also a complex group structure. Oh, sorry, a vertical group and a D shaped complex group structure as well. So let's firstly look at your vertical complex group structures. Uh, so here you can see if we go back to the notes now, as opposed to the, the, the slide presentation, uh, you've got the, the parent at the top that has 80 percent of the subsidiary. So therefore it has control, doesn't it? Uh, and as you have control, you can then work out, can't we, that you've got, is it a non-controlling interest equal to, is it 20 percent? OK. Uh, but then what you can see as well is that you've got the parent that controls the sub and the sub controls the sub sub. OK, uh, so we're going to consolidate the sub. We're going to consolidate the sub sub. But, but what about the percentage ownership? What effectively do the parent shareholders own of the sub subsidiary? Well, it's nice and straightforward. What you go through and do there is you just multiply down the spine. So you've got 80% of 60% is that 48%. So your 48% I refer to as your effective controlling interest or the level of effective control. And we know that there is a 100% ownership in full of the sub subsidiary. So 52%. gives you the effective non-controlling interest okay so that's what you've got to be careful of you've got to really think about it with regards to the power to direct the activities because if you multiply down the spine and say well look we have 48 percent which is therefore less than 50 percent and i do not control it then you are wrong aren't you because the parent controls the sub and the sub controls the sub sub so the shareholders in the parent have the power to direct the activities, not just in S, but in SS as well, isn't it? Because they have control of the sub, because they can appoint the directors and, and pass a, an ordinary resolution to get those directors in place. Once those directors are in place there, we can then go through there and put the directors in place down here in the sub sub, because we have control, don't we, over that sub sub. Okay, But when you work out the effective level of control, we actually effectively own 48 percent of it but we have the power to direct the activity so therefore it gives us control okay so it doesn't necessarily have to be that we own greater than 50 percent uh, to have control of a sub subsidiary okay so let that just be a warning hopefully you'll heed that warning as you work through the examples uh so what you've got then uh nice and simple multiply down the spine uh over the page within the notes, it's just thinking about the working. So goodwill is that working three, NCI working number four. Uh, there isn't anything too much different at all with the goodwill in the sub. OK, so you still go through that. You take your fair value of consideration. You add on the NCI acquisition, whether that be at fair value or your proportionate share of net assets. And then you deduct the net asset to acquisition. And don't forget that they tend to come, don't they, from working number two. Okay.
easy. Nothing difficult at all. The issue that you have here is this number there in the sub sub. Okay, so do try and lay it out as such in a three column approach. Narrative down the middle, sub information on the left, sub sub there on the right. Okay, uh, and dealing with the sub sub is where the challenge awaits. Dealing with the sub is no different from what you've seen in F7. So what we need to do now, remember we are reporting to the parent shareholders, aren't we? So if that's the case, what does the parent own of the investment that the sub has in the sub subsidiary? Well, we need to take the investment that is held in the sub. Okay, so the investment the sub has in the sub sub. And we need to look at how much the parent shareholders own. So if we go back to our example or our illustration that we had up here, then if we're going through and looking at what the parent owns of the sub, remember there is going to be an investment in here in the sub of what the sub owns in the sub sub, isn't it? And the parent owns 80% of that investment. So when we're recording the goodwill, we're going to put in 80% of that investment because that is what the parent owns, isn't it? Okay. Uh, you then add on your NCI acquisition. Again, uh, the NCI acquisition, fair value method or proportionate share of net assets method and everything there will be based upon your effective holding. So was our effective holding 48%. So that's what we would use there. And then you deduct the net assets at acquisition. Okay, so there's that one number there at the top of your goodwill calculation that you just need to think about. Other than that, everything else isn't too bad. Okay. Uh, the non-controlling interest. Again, what I would do there is I would write your percentage non-controlling interest at the top of each column. So for the sub, using our illustration, we own 80. So the NCI was 20. And for the sub sub, it's 52%, isn't it? Okay. Uh, again, same format, same layout. There's something ever so slightly different just on the bottom left of your screen, isn't there? But we'll ignore that for now. You go through there and take your non-controlling interest at acquisition. So that's the number that you've got from, from working number three. So here, that NCI acquisition should be the same figure that you use within the NCI acquisition there. In the sub sub, again, you use exactly the same figure there as what you then used here. Okay, Ooh, careful, drop down one too many. Wrong X circled, that one there. Okay, uh, so the NCI acquisition needs to be the same in the goodwill and the NCI calculation. Uh, again, same situation as what we've seen previously. You look at the post acquisition movement in net assets from working number two, and you take the non controlling interest share. So, again, non controlling interest share 20, non controlling interest share 52%. Okay. Then you have the hardest bit. So, it gets the VH treatment. It doesn't just get the H for hard, it gets the VH for very hard. It may even get the double VH treatment as very, very hard. But Let's see how we get on. The easiest thing to do is to note that it's worth one mark within the exam. Don't bother. Move on. Leave it. You'll be there thinking for hours and hours about how to do it. You'll be procrastinating. You'll be looking up in the sky. You'll be looking around at your friend going, oh, I don't, what, what do I do? Just look at it. Acknowledge that it's something that you couldn't be bothered revising and you've moved on with. But I will explain it to you. Okay. Because what we've got to do is we need to work out the non-controlling interest in the sub subsidiary. Okay. Uh, and we're here, first of all, looking at the non-controlling interest in the sub. And that's the key aspect. We're looking just at the subsidiary only. So, so what do the non-controlling interest own of that sub? Well, they own all of the assets and all of the liabilities. The issue that you've got is that contained within the subsidiary's assets is an asset that's an investment in the sub subsidiary. And we don't to want to look at anything to do with the sub subsidiary when we're working out the non-controlling interest in the sub. So you've got parent, 
sub, sub, sub. We're looking at the non-controlling interest, the 20% ownership share in that subsidiary. There is part of that subsidiary has an investment in the sub, sub. And we will need to remove the non-controlling interest share in that investment. So what we need to do is we need to take the non-controlling interest share. So here, 20% of the cost of S's investment in the sub subsidiary. So whatever investment is sat in S's books in relation to SS's books, we need to take the non-controlling interest share of it and remove it from the non-controlling interest in S. Are you suitably confused and scared? I would be if I were you. The key issue is that you're just looking at the pure subsidiary, nothing to do with the sub sub. So therefore, anything to do with the sub sub, you need to remove. And the only thing that's in relation to the sub sub that's in S's books is the investment in the sub sub. So we're going to have to remove the non controlling interest share of that investment okay remember it okay it's a pro forma if you can learn the pro forma remember it commit it to memory then you're not going to go too far wrong if you try to logic it out within the exam then all the very 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 best of luck to you so all that we've seen here is that there's two additional bits to think about when you have your vertical group structure isn't there first of all we need to go through there don't we and adjust for p share of the investment when we're calculating the goodwill okay so up there uh, whatever the investment that s has in ss we take p share so is that 80 percent and then for the other 20 percent we adjust don't we in the non-controlling interest calculations of the sub okay uh, and that needs to be removed so it needs to be placed in brackets once you've done all that take the two goodwill figures add them together take the two non-controlling interest figures add them together and put them on the face of the statement of financial position that's it there'll be all sorts of other weird wonderful adjustments pub adjustments fair value adjustments intra-company balances individual accounting standard adjustments but that's it in terms of the vertical group structure okay so it's about time now that we went through and did an example which we will see within the next video.